Eric Solheim, Head of United Nations Environment. I'm so grateful to you, Eric, for the interview. You're in Nairobi as, as we speak on the phone. And I wanted to ask you, Eric, to start with, you know, how optimistic are you about our global efforts to address the environmental challenges of our time? I am fundamentally optimistic and I think much more optimistic than uh, most other people or many other people. And that's because we have seen in the past the ability of humans to resolve enormous challenges. I mean, the clear examples is, of course, slavery, which was complete and normal all over the planet just 200 years uh, ago. I mean, priests said it was in the Bible, Mullah said it was in the Quran, uh, British economists said uh, in British Empire, because oh, no, no, there is, there is no slavery. And then a small group of people started fighting it, and they won. And you can give any number of examples, big and small. A small one from the recent times is only 14 years ago that one nation, Ireland, started prohibiting smoking in restaurants. At the time, you were basically allowed to, uh, to smoke in every single restaurant around the globe. Mm. Now, 14 years later, uh, you are basically not allowed to, uh, to smoke in any restaurant that ever you come on planet Earth. So change can happen very fast, and we have proven it in, in the past. But, uh, but um, at the moment, I think we can see two very contradictory trends. One negative term, Mother Earth is fighting back. Last year we saw huge, uh, huge natural catastrophes. I mean, violence in the Caribbean, basically all the infrastructure wiped out, flooding in, in Houston, flooding in India, floods in Sierra Leone, so many uh, examples of, uh, of enormous destruction. On the other hand, uh, we are also at an unprecedented time of change. Um, we have uh, most encouraging of all the price of solar and wind has now come down to a level where it can compete with coal everywhere on the planet. Because when you change the economic equation, it, it basically changes everything. No one has been in doubt in the past that, coal, that solar is better for the environment or for health and for, for society, but simply that coal was so much cheaper that everyone still uh, wanted to or felt they needed to, uh, to do coal. Um, Throughout where, where we see the biggest change, the big difference, only 10 years back, the attitude in Europe was that we need to convince the Chinese and the Indians and the developing world of the need to take care of the environment. Now we see particularly China uh, taking up leadership, m more domestically than globally still, but the speed of change in environment, uh, on the environment in China is similar to the speed we have seen on development over the last 40 years, so it will have enormous impact. I can speak for very, much longer, but just to get started. No, thank you, Eric. It's it's very good to hear you. And you know, the, the best of times and the worst of times, as you say. You know, this uh, significant yeah. environmental deterioration, but also huge amount of action. So I suppose the question is, you know, are we going fast enough? If you look at the issue of ocean plastic that we're currently looking at. You know, this situation is so terrible. There's so much plastic already in the ocean, but the world seems to be waking up to the issue. But do you think we can now act in time to prevent further pollution of this scale of, in plastic in the ocean? I mean, there, there can be no doubt on the answer to the question, are we acting fast enough? For sure, we are not. We can act much faster. Uh, what caused my optimism is the ability of us to act fast and determine when that decision is made. I think I listened to Barack Obama uh, just before he left his office and he said uh, in an interesting that my two young daughters, uh, Sasha and Maura, uh, they don't understand uh, the word uh, acid rain. Then he said, my, when I was a young person, that was the main environment issue in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't understand it because the problem is gone. Mm. There is no acid rain in the UK or Norway or, 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 or the United States any longer. Mm. It was resolved. And then he exposed a theory of change, which I think is more or less universal. Change will happen when three factors come together. One is citizens. I mean, citizens, there must be a demand for change from citizens. I mean, like there was some smoking, and not everyone wanted to stop smoking in restaurants, but a substantial amount of people demanded it. So there was a demand from society, uh, which, of course, we can organize through civil society, through campaigns, and in the context of plastic, through beach cleanups. You see some of the big beach cleanups in India in particular. 
thousands upon thousands of people coming out, and that, that of course, put pressure on, on politics and business. Secondly, we need uh, political leadership, and also, again, coming from very varied circles, the United Kingdom has prohibited it. Uh, and microplastic recently, Kenya has prohibited the plastic bags, so has Rwanda, Eritrea, Marshall Line, and one other. A number of nations have taken action of different sorts, but of course we need that more. And we need market and business to take the lead, because only business can make the replacement products. In the case of plastic, I think we, uh, we need to phase out what we don't need. There is no society need for straws. Everyone mm-hmm. can drink from mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. bottle or from a glass or from a cup. I mean, your mm-hmm. parents or, or, or grandparents did that their entire life. not harm from that. The average North American is using 600 straws a year. Mm-hmm. Many of them ending up in oceans. So microplastics, as prohibited in the UK, is so another example of what we don't need. Let's just get it out, get it prohibited, take it out. Then there is the plastic we need for preserving food longer so that it's not thrown away, but that, that which could be easily replaced in other better products. That's happening, but not at the speed we want, but uh, Nestle and Anonymous just announced that they will make 100% uh, degradable plastic bottles by 2020, and they will make the technology available for everyone. Uh, Coca-Cola just announced that they will have a net, net zero um, uh, waste of their plastic uh, bottles by 2030, and that give the guarantee that will happen everywhere. I mean, not just in Atlanta, but also in Burkina Faso and Nepal. Uh, so, and um, business needs to be a lot more innovative, but both politics and business react much faster if there's a pressure from citizens and then on every other issue in human history up to now. Thank you. So the Obama maxim, Eric, is citizens, political leadership, and business and private sector innovation, effectively. Is that right? Yeah, he he, he may not have put in exactly those words. That is my interpretation, but also what I believe in. So yes. uh, he kind of, uh, he, he's messed in open doors uh, uh, with me on this. Yes, yes, fantastic. And Eric, do we need better global environmental governance? I mean, if you look at the Montreal Protocol on the ozone layer and the Kigali Protocol, which was signed um, within the last two years on refrigerants, you know, these these were quite significant global agreements. Of course, the Paris Agreement itself was very significant. But are our international institutions up to the task, or do we need better environmental governance at the global level? Um, I think there is a need for a kind of nuanced answer to that question. I mean, first of all, Montreal Protocol is probably the most successful global treaty of any sort, not just on environment, but on peace or disarmament or trade or whatever. Mm. Hard to think of any other agreement which has been implemented to 100%, mm. where the money promised was delivered to 100%, every nation in the world on board. And also where we now see the results. I mean, British and other scientists say that we see clear recovery of the ozone layer uh, uh, above the, the Antarctic. So it worked, and it worked basically for the same reasons which I just described. Uh, scientists gave the scientific platform for why we needed to change, or why, why this was a huge problem. British, American, Mexican scientists were the most critical at the time. Uh, then citizens demanded the change and said they don't want to live this way any longer. Then politicians came together in Montreal and reminded um, myself this was Thatcher and Reagan and the then conservative uh, uh, Canadian um, uh, 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 prime minister. So it was not a bunch of green radicals. <laughs> uh, and then and then business lived up to the change uh, uh, with innovation and, and new products. So it's a model. Treaty. For sure, we need these kind of treaties like Paris, but also we need to accept that on, on many issues that it takes time and we should not wait. There is no need to wait for a global treaty against plastic. We can, we can just start working now. There is no global treaty prohibiting smoking in restaurants. It has happened. Mm-hmm. It has happened because some nations took the lead. They showed that it's also very good for the people. And then others copied it, and they copied it at a very rapid speed. And now, while it was controversial in the beginning, I mean, the support for 
a restaurant, uh, uh, stopping, no smoking restaurant, at least in Norway, something like 96 percent, something like that. It's as close to 100 as it can, mm-hmm. if you can be. Um, so plastic, uh, if you, it will take far too long to get a binding global agreement. But then Kenya, Kenya take a, a brave step forward, of course. I mean, Tanzania and Ethiopia and also nations on other parts of the planet are taking notice. Then Kenya decided to move on plastic. Uh, they asked us, the environment, for help. And the main help we could bring them was simply to bring people from Rwanda. You could tell them what they've done in Rwanda, how the people have acted, have responded in Rwanda, how it had been a big success in Rwanda. And then the Kenyan government felt, felt much more comfortable to do it. Kenya is more, it's a bigger, more complex society than Rwanda. But still it was, I think, very, very helpful for them to see that this had worked in another place. Uh, um, on many issues, we need to believe in this. If one company are able to phase out plastic bottles, I'd, you will immediately see the pressure on the others to act in the same in the mm. same direction. Mm. Fantastic. Thank That's you. why I believe, believe in Nestle and Danone getting biodegradable bottles, Coca-Cola collecting all the bottles. Uh, of course, I mean, it will be very hard over time for Pepsi to have a different view than, than Coca, mm. just as an example. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Or for beer, 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 beer breweries to tell us, oh, oh we, we, can, we, cannot do, we cannot do collecting uh, of bottles, but Coca-Cola can. Uh, how, how, can they, how, can they, how can they stand up with that argument over time? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Eric, for an inspiring example. I also wanted to ask you about rainforests. I think you and I first met when you were working for the Norwegian government on rainforest conservation and this amazing so, yeah. commitment that the Norwegian so, yeah. made on Red Plus, as it was called, and I talk about that in the book, and you and I travelled to the Colombian Amazon together. But I, you know, I, I look at the numbers uh-huh. and the forest loss in the world, and I think, my goodness, you know, we've made progress, but still we are losing, alas, you know, in the order of 10 million hectares of rainforest every year. And the world hasn't yet put arguably enough money on the table to really reward forest nations for keeping their forests standing. What's your view on the latest on forests and uh, restoration, conservation and restoration of forests? I mean, I, let's take Indonesia as an example because I think it clarifies where, where the problems are. I mean, Indonesian government or parliament has put up fantastic laws. No one, I mean, neither you nor me, not even Greenpeace, can really find any, any flaws with, with their laws and regulations. Indonesia, they are basically absolutely 100% uh, the right thing to do. Uh, did all the big players in the, uh, in the, um, um, both the paper and pulp and the, uh, and the palm oil industry has given a clear pledge, no, uh, for the, no deforestation. Mm-hmm. Still, you see substantial deforestation in Indonesia, even when both government and business have promised not to do it. Uh, why is that? From my analysis, it is because uh, there is a political flaw here. It's not really no benefit from a, for a governor or for political authorities at the regional level to send in police to stop people to cut down the forest. They will get no votes from it, no basic sympathy in society. Uh, the, uh, of course, there is no there is no money, corrupt money flow from flow from stopping. Uh, for deforestation, but there may be a corrupt money flow from allowing deforestation. So when you add all these factors, pure, no votes, no corruption or no corrupt money, uh, no big support in society, you get into a situation where people turn their head and look another way when, when it happens. How to solve that problem? I think we need to intervene in a combination of two. One is uh, allowing for economic development, which is not related to deforestation. In the case of Indonesia, for instance, uh, increasing the, the productivity of the palm oil, oil uh, farmer, I and mean, some of them is one-sixth of the productivity of the more product, productive ones. So you can increase the productivity of your farm. Uh, there may still be a temptation to go and cut forest and even add to your, to your income, but that it will also be more difficult to argue and argue and temptation will be less. So this economic package which can come 
at the end of the day with a combination of reinforced money like Novi put up and, and private investment. That's why we, what we tried to do now, we made a big agreement with BNP Paribas. I think it's Europe's biggest bank or second biggest mm-hmm. to invest in the small scale farmer. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Indonesian government needs to step up and use the, the forces of the state, meaning the police, to stop it. A difficult thing is the police, unless you also have the economic positive incentive. Mm-hmm. But you cannot just have the positive incentive, you also need to. Uh, stop it. But I think combination of these two is what, what will really transform from good laws, a lot of good pledges. Mm. I mean, it's not like the president of Indonesia is condoning cutting of forests, not at all, mm. nor do I believe that the top, top leadership of the big uh, palmer companies are instigating this. Mm. But they may be look, people may be looking another way, and of course, when forest is already cut down, Palmer companies may in the long run take advantage of it, even if they're not instigated it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, political economy fundamentally. Exactly, the change, that's right. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the fundamental problem of capitalism, in my view, and as you may know, I'm also a big supporter of the fantastic progress which capitalism has brought, but the, mm. the fundamental problem is that the, <coughs> the uh, the profit of destroying nature or destroying the planet is nearly all of this privatized to individuals or to companies or in some cases to states, while the costs are nearly all the socialized. I mean, they're taken by the taxpayers or by the global public at large or by the next generation. Mm-hmm. This is such a fundamental flaw. It must mm-hmm. be compensated by counter. Uh, counter processes politically and economically. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely, and a fundamentally different economic understanding of the value that nature gives and w- w- what is lost through its de- de- depletion. And you, um, on the, in the big picture of um, of uh, forest, you are right. I mean, many, many more nations that in the past have stepped up at the highest level of state. I mean, in Davos last week. I was listening to President Santos of Colombia, and I mean he is fantastic. He's impeccable. I mean I can find I mean I can have I can find no flaw with him. Mm. Then so well on the peace process. I mean he, true is a centre right politician maybe in a formal sense, mm. uh, but um, his his passion for the forest and the, the land of Colombia, mm. uh, he can, not even a prince can can do it better. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, so what's the problem? Well, he's not he's he's not a Stalin or, or Colombia. There are mm. many more processes in society, and of course, when when peace came with with uh, with FARC, uh, there were a lot of lawless areas. A lot of people felt that over time uh, there would be uh, more control. So let's cut the forest before these can before the state is really able to control the areas. Mm. So he said that that's why we have seen increase in. In um, in uh, deforestation in Colombia, even at the time when you suspect it would be the opposite, but people are taking benefit of lawlessness and in the anticipation that uh, a more a, a better, more uh, more well-working state will come in a, in a say a five years um, perspective. Yes, yes, well, well summarised. Well, we hope that um, Santos's commitment will be will continue in the next government. Eric, and, you know, the political cycle is, you know, we, we look at Indonesia again and President Jokowi, perhaps next year there are presidential elections, you know, will he win, uh, will will the commitment continue? And, and one wonders whether the political cycle is also at odds with what we're trying to do in the long run. We need better politics, but there is also a, a disconnect, isn't there, Eric, between the politics and the, the long-term commitment that we need? I mean, there can, there can hardly be any argument that... Uh, uh, there are benefits of the of the long term stability of a merit based system, uh, like uh, was put up by the Chinese Communist Party. And Western democracy uh, has kind of, in my view, has kind of won the struggle on on the moral and intellectual level. I mean, most people on the planet accept democracy as the uh, the ideal system, uh, but also Western democracy struggle. It's because if it cannot deliver over time, it will not uh, it will not uh, win the competition. I mean, the uh, people look of, of every level of society. They look for good system, but they also look for good deliveries. And 
Mm. Uh, many nations where you have a very, very short time horizon, every politician is uh, struggling to, to stay alive until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, elections, um, just in my own nation, I mean, I followed the election last fall. As I can see, see it, it was not focused on any of the big issues over time at all, mm -hmm. uh, and not focused on what will, will define the life of Norwegians in the 10, 20, 30 years horizon. I mean, mm -hmm. issues like how do we phase out oil and move into the renewable economy? You may like it or not. I mean, many of us like it, but not all. Just <laughs> it's a huge issue for us facing Norway. How do we? How do we handle artificial intelligence? How do we work on, how do we provide for jobs and even better jobs in a new economy where companies like Amazon will replace supermarkets nearly, nearly everywhere uh, in the world? How do we design our health system when they are living, fortunately, longer and longer and the time after uh, people are retired where they can still stay uh, alive and, and work long? Eric, hello. I'm sorry, I lost you for a moment there. Do you want to conclude? Uh, it, it was my take. Uh, I, I was sitting in the sun, so the, the phone was overheated. But <laughs> I turned it down so we can continue. I, I, I'll move away from the sun. Don't worry, don't, don't worry. worry. Well, Eric, I wanted to ask you about Andhra Pradesh. You know that wonderful example of yeah. organic agriculture or, or reduced fertilizer agriculture that you were showcasing last week. Is that right? That if, if this works, I think it will be a huge game changer. I mean, the World Bank said, came and said this is the global significant. If some, the, the chief minister Nadu of Andhra Pradesh has put his entire political capital behind it. So if it works, I think it will be elected until Buddha comes back to Earth. Uh, if, it, if it's a, a big fiasco, of course, it will be in big political trouble. So he has put his entire capital behind it. What it is, is a partnership between the state of Andhra Pradesh, the environment, and BNP Paribas. The aim is to transform six million farmers, which is basically all the farmers in Andhra Pradesh, into what is called natural farming. Less fertilizer, less pesticides, uh, more investment in, uh, in, in the farms in different other ways, turning into using the, the waste and the the cow, uh, cow, uh, pea, whatever, uh, uh, as a fertilizer, you will save a huge amount of money which the government of India used to subsidize, and you can use that money into to other sorts of investments. And they have already done this for about 150,000 farmers, and uh, they believe that it can be for the for the entire entire state. It's also a huge positive for the biodiversity, I and mean, then you see insects and different sorts of animals coming back because they are, of course, dying because of the pesticides which are used. Uh, so it, it, if it works, it will increase the income. Uh, it will improve the biodiversity. It will give less climate effects. So it's a really win-win-win-win situation. So hopes are big. Fantastic. Fantastic, Eric. That's a wonderful example. Um, sorry, if, please. if it works, the others, I mean, it will for sure. Uh, we copied in many other parts of India. Andhra Pradesh is one of the biggest agriculture states in India, and population is 55 million. Uh, and uh, they are number one or two on lots and lots of different products. I mean, Chief Minister Nadu had a long, long list. I mean, I, I can't recall that second biggest rice producer, biggest tomato producer, second biggest mango producer, etc. Et et mm -hmm. Wonderful. And Eric, I mean, you're such a treasure trove of good examples. I mustn't abuse your time. but. Are there any, I mean, for example, on fresh water, I read a piece by you recently, you went back to the Iraqi, or went to the Iraqi marshlands that I used to uh, be involved in, and, you know, the, the water seems to be coming back and being restored. Is that right? It is right, but we are not yet there. No. Basically, like you said, said initially, there, there, there is a lot of progress, but, but not enough. Uh, as you would recall, Saddam drained it up for political reasons. I mean, he felt that Arabs living in the region were against him, which <laughs> for sure they were. Mm. Uh, and he, his reaction was to, to drain the marshlands to get people out. Mm. Uh, then after, after Saddam, uh, they have done a lot of efforts to restore them. Uh, but the Iraqi perspective, rightly or wrongly, is that 
Uh, still, there is not enough water in Euphrates and Tigris. They are critical to some of the dams uh, the Turks have built at the upper uh, at the river. Um, but it's also true that a lot of water has come back. Uh, it's a, now a beautiful area, but it's, it's not fully restored. Exact percentage which is a restoration I, I can, can't give you, but we, we just had a mission there. I can happy to connect you to the people who went on that mission. That was also a joint Iraqi Iran mission because the marshlands are across, I mean, while them, most of them are in Iraq, they're also crossing the border into Iraq. Mm-hmm. But for that long, for long term solutions, I mean, Iraq, Iran, and Turkey, uh, we need to work together. Maybe other nations as well, but at least these three. There are, by the way, similar issues on the border between Afghanistan and, and, and Iran. And Trump's boundary water management, I think, is one of the most important issues for the, for the planet in the years to come. It's a major potential source for wars and conflict, mm. a huge economic and uh, environment issue. I mean, mm. one nation cannot just restore a river by itself. It, other, it comes from other nations, so you, you need to work together. It's a, one of the areas where uh, different global and regional treaties and uh, must come. Maybe the, the biggest of them all is, of course, the Nile, where the mm. Amazon dam in, in, in Ethiopia mm. will or will not have huge impact on Egypt. Mm. And the three nations in Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt need to come together, maybe with the rest of the Nile Basin states also, mm. but at least these three. Mm-hmm. Very good, Eric. Yes, you're, you're of course entirely right about the Grand Renaissance Dam and its potential impact. It's significant. Th- there are just a couple of other issues, Eric, if yeah, I may. There, yes, there, 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 there is hardly any nation on the planet who's so dependent on one river as Egypt uh, yeah. is on the Nile. I mean, without the Nile, there is no, there's simply no, no Egypt. So, and of course, if you open up past 100 million, and Egypt, I think, is around 90. So these are second and third biggest nation in Africa. So this is, this is a, it's managed well, it can have good impact, so it's managed poorly, it's a, it's a potential uh, mm. social conflict and, <clears throat> and also environment uh, degradation. Mm. But there are many others, Mekong is another one. Interestingly enough, if you go to India, while the most of the big rivers in, in or many of the big rivers in India are just within one nation, <laughs> but the, the, uh, the language and the rhetoric between, say, the <laughs> state of uh, Tamil Nadu and the state of Karnataka, I, I won't say it's warlike, but, but at least it's very aggressive when it comes to water management issues. And uh, earlier this year, we <laughs> visited the state of Odisha, which is down river, and frankly, they didn't have a lot of positive words <laughs> about the mm. river state. <laughs> This will require your, your peace yeah, it's, building. Yeah, it's like a huge, huge issue everywhere. Of course, because our ability to drain rivers for agriculture purposes or our ability to pollute them is so much bigger in the past. Uh, that, uh, of course, a, a state or a nation, a river can, of course, in, in certain cases, they can uh, drain and use all the water so there's nothing left for those down river, mm. downstream. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Eric. Well, we might need your past experience negotiating the end of the Sri Lankan civil conflict um, to address some of these transboundary challenges. But, uh, Eric, there's a couple of other chapters in the book. You don't need to address all of them. One is on biodiversity, um, not just the poaching crisis, but, you know, the global biodiversity crisis we're living. There's also a chapter on the ocean I've mentioned already, the cities chapter. I was in Jakarta this week, and my goodness, you know, the challenges from an urban perspective are significant. And then there's also a chapter, Eric, finally, on waste and the circular economy, which we've touched on with plastics. Um, but I was just wondering, you know, are there any examples across these issues, biodiversity, cities, waste and the circular economy, um, that uh, particularly inspire you and which you think um, deserve scaling up elsewhere? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, let's start with cities. Um, it's hard not to be impressed with what has happened in China over the last uh, few years. I mean, mm. in year 2002, there were two uh, cities. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, in 2002, there were two cities in China with metro, so for Beijing and Shanghai. Both had two metro lines. In 2017, the metro of Shanghai and Beijing are the two biggest in the world, and Beijing is the biggest, Shanghai is the second biggest. 
far ahead of New York or anything else and rapidly uh, moving ahead. And there are something like 35 different cities all over China with metro lines. When you compare that to the mega city like Jakarta, which basically have hardly any public transport system at all, at least mm -hmm. very limited. Uh, you may, may ask, what is the trick? And I think that's critical. What, what is it about the decision-making process in China or the financing model they use in China is make it possible for China to roll this out in a speed no one else has managed. And it's not just metros. Two-thirds of all high-speed rail in the world is now in China. In Norway, we have a so-called intercity triangle around Oslo, and we are very happy with if by 2030 we can have made this up to 250 kilometers per hour. <laughs> and it, the length is uh, something like maybe 400 kilometers, something like that. And we got that, that the Chinese do in a couple of, couple, of, uh, couple of years. And it's not, as people claim, an easy, an easy terrain. Some of the newly, newly established day lines in China is in areas with 70% or the entire track is either in tunnel or, or on or, or on bridge. So I think we need to ask how is that possible? Also contrary to believe some of the really lively cities in the world, like say Shenzhen, are in China. It's a very green city. They have they have uh, uh, targets for targets for uh, for parks which are I think fifty percent of the area of, of Shenzhen should be shall be in parks and and green areas um, very soon. Uh, there are also lots of spectacular new modern buildings um, that have engaged the best architects in the world. I mean, lots of architects from the rest of the world are now, of course, moving to China because they have any number of opportunities which are not there in the rest of the world. So mm. asking what it and avoid this kind of very easy solution because it's <coughs> saying that it's just because uh, a Chinese system is uh, more well-functioning and authoritarian, but rather also specific question, how, how, did, how did they do it, and how can we do it in India and Indonesia and the Philippines and mm. other places? Mm. And how, how can we bring together the packages of finance? Mm. There is no way a big city can function without public transport. Mm. Mm. For sure not. I mean, it, it, you can bring any number of new vehicles into the road and just, uh, just uh, stop everything. Mm. Mm. So on cities, I think uh, that's that's a very critical uh, question to, to ask for a city like, like Jakarta. Vietnam is now Hanoi and, and Ho Chi Minh City will open the first metros, I think, this year or next year. So there, there, there are something is happening, but that speed of China is beyond anything else. Yes, yes. And, and you're at the heart of the, the efforts to address the poaching crisis, Eric, being in Nairobi and Kenya's leadership and so on. Do you feel like we might be turning the tide there on this terrible poaching? Uh, I'm looking to the inspiring examples. I mean, two African nations have done fantastically well, uh, among others. I mean, Botswana uh, and Rwanda. Um, the, I think the Botswana slogan which is... Uh, Low impact, high, and then high revenue or high income tourism that is able to make tourism sector fantastic, uh, um, fantastic producer jobs, uh, income, revenue, taxes, uh, and all this, while at the same time improving the, uh, the, the uh, increasing the number of animals like, like, like elephants. Mm -hmm. Same in Rwanda, I was there just earlier this month or last month. Uh, they are now charging you $1,500 per person for seeing the gorillas in for one hour. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a, quite an expense if you bring a family there. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, doing that makes these national parks such an income-generating machinery, uh, providing any number of jobs for taxi drivers, also uh, waiters, snack uh, sellers, or, or tourist guys or whatever. So the people in the in the area will be the first to defend defend the parks. Mm -hmm. I think to make this link between conservation and tourism and jobs mm -hmm. uh, is absolutely critical. We are back to the, the first we discussed also from the rainforest. There is no way African government at the end can send police to every place where there is poaching 
if the local people support the poachers. Mm. The local people are the first to stop to report uh, the sea poachers in the region. They immediately alert the police. Uh, it, it, it's very difficult for poachers. Poachers depend on being able to 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 uh, to corrupt people, to pay money to local officials, to hide among the local people. Uh, if they can't do that, they are in deep, deep trouble. So that's why this this economic link, people in the in the area see the benefit from this part, it benefits from the elephants. There are systems to avoid elephants coming into our land and destroy my crop. Because if a farmer and one elephant can destroy a, a year's income from a farmer in a in a night. <laughs> Uh, you, you can you can hardly blame the mm. you can hardly blame that sure. family father for being being angry. Uh, so systems establish system in which to have. I mean, must have more like good systems to make sure that elephants are not destroying the crops of the or farmers in the neighborhood. But then people seeing economic benefit, then they will be the first line of, of, of stopping poaching. So I think there is no. I mean, people may think this is. Uh, a true economical perspective, but I think conservationists will fail if they don't bring in this local uh, local community and economic perspective into the thinking. Yes. Especially the President of Seven in, in Uganda a couple of months back, uh, and his perspective of how, how can we improve the conservation of the national parks of, of um, Uganda so that we get more tourists, so that we uh, and get more more revenue to spend on on, uh, on continuing the continuing the improvements of the parks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's mm-hmm. where and um, in Africa there is a difference between Africa and all other continents. African tourism is the large extent wildlife based because I mean Africa has deep have, have beaches, but beaches are as good in Sri Lanka or in Thailand or mm. uh, or in Turkey or Spain. Africa have hotels, but again, hotels are better in New York or Tokyo or Beijing. Uh, we have bears there, but uh, we cannot claim that the African bears are better than than, than European than German bears, uh, or that South African wine is superior to French wine. So the Africa is really superior to any other continent is on wildlife. Yeah. Wildlife is much more vibrant, much 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 more to be seen. You can go for a walk. Sorry if I talked too long, but if, if I go for a walk for one uh, week in the Norwegian mountains, I may see one news. And I'll be very happy. I will tell all my <laughs> friends about this fantastic <laughs> encounter. If I go out to Masamara, I mean, in, in the first normal second after going out to the aircraft, I will see many, many, many more animals than I can see for a weekend or a month in the Norwegian mountains. Yes, yes. So, Protecting this uh, wildlife is critical to the economy and tourism and jobs in Africa. Tourism, by the way, is the biggest job creating sector of, of anyone. There's no way you can then stay in the smallest hotel or restaurants without staff, while a lot of high tech things like car production you can you can run basically without without any staff. Mm-hmm. Um, we are trying to lead up to 2020, where China uh, will host the Global Biodiversity Treaty. Uh, there is a meeting in China Sheikh in Egypt in the end of this year, but 2020 is what we will hope to be, make a big splash for biodiversity, like Paris was for climate. Mm. If China and Xi Jinping take, takes the lead, we will be able to bring this up to a much higher level. So that, mm. that's our ambition, that China can really, really lead. And, and in the turnaround, I mean, Xi's speeches, he's speaking about environment quite a lot, and like a slow, it's like beautiful China, ecological civilization. Mm. So I think China is ready for that leadership. And if he takes the lead, it will have uh, the charm. I mean, the French, French leadership was critical in, in Paris, and Chinese leadership of this will have huge, uh, huge uh, promise. Wonderful, wonderful. That's what you hope. Thank you yeah. so much, Eric. It's, it's so good to listen to you. I, we wish to do that for much longer, but I must be respectful of your time. You're a busy man as the head of the UN Environment. So if you'll forgive me, just one last question, Eric. And it's to do with <laughs> the French Environment Minister, Nicolas Hulot, his idea of a global environmental pact, which Mr. Macron has taken forward and so on. I was quite struck by this. You know, we, we don't have one single unifying global legally binding environmental pact. But I was wondering, is that where we should really be focusing, or ultimately, is the action that we need to see happen? Is it ultimately at the level of 
individual countries, politics, businesses, civil society, as you were describing earlier, or do we need both? I'm just interested to hear your views on this new idea of a, a global environmental pact. My view is very simple. I mean, one is underpinning the other. I mean, of course, if you if you start negotiations for such a pact, then and uh, believe it's a sleeping pill that then you don't need to do anything else because it will be very disastrous. But these kind of discussions tend to make it more likely that you see actions by governments and by business and by civil society rather than less. So let's aim at having such an instrument that the French have in mind. It's an instrument similar to the Human Rights um, Pact and the Economic and Social Pact, which was made by the UN a long time back. So they want to establish environment as a third pillar in the same formal sense. And I think it's a good idea. We should provide the Secretariat and we will, we will support this. And of course, I mean, changes in the real life is always the most important. Uh, so what governments do at home, what business do in the supply chain is, is more important than uh, than global text. I mean, we have global. I mean, we, we have we have the um, global uh, declaration of human rights. Uh, very few people argue that it's not a helpful instrument, but also, of course, very few people argue that it's solving all problems. <laughs> Unless governments and yeah. uh, and others are respecting this instrument, it is of limited value. But but it does set them kind of a moral moral standard and uh, something which we should all aim at. And I think. Uh, the same would be the case here. There have been some some questions asked. I mean, overall, I think the French initiative has, has been welcome, but some people have asked that really, as you indirectly do, we need a new instrument. And again, I think it would be good, but it cannot replace action. Secondly, mm -hmm. some have been worried that it may be a setback, and because. Um, we have, we have, of course, we, there will hardly be anything completely new in such sex because we have any number of different instruments and biodiversity and climate and uh, many other areas where we have made global principles. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not so much afraid of setback. Number one, the French will have that as a starting uh, plank. They will get that into the text from the beginning, as I said, in no setbacks. Yeah. And yeah. secondly, uh, there is a much, in my view, much more favorable situation because the, the biggest developing nations like China and India, who in the past may have been reluctant to global environment treaties, believing that they may hamper their economic growth and give them a uh, disadvantage in the global competition, are now moved from being reluctant to into a leadership role. So we, are, we cannot count on American leadership in this particular era, uh, but we can also, should also respect that the United States has not really done anything at the global level on the environment, which has been uh, very destructive. I and mean, they played ball and bomb with the climate. They did the Montreal for the Montreal Protocol and Kigal Amendment. They did that our environment assembly. In neither place, I mean, the United States didn't provide the normal leadership, but nor did it did it obstruct. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, interesting. Well, Eric, thank you. This has been really very, very stimulating and wide ranging, and you know, we are all very grateful for your wonderful leadership, Eric, and all that you do. How long have you got left in your post, Eric? Um, it's no one not coming out. I will say that for two and a half years more, and. At that time, of course, Guterres may contemplate uh, renewing my mandate if it is, but that's, that's long into the future. Okay. Turn out there. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. Well, I wish you very well, Eric, and, and thank you for your your optimism, but also your sober assessment of the issues. I've really been very grateful for that. Thank you. I'm looking forward to, to seeing your book and to see you in uh, London.